that uh, it goes in uh, two directions. Um, and that's, that's what makes it a, uh, kind of an interesting uh, complex uh, uh, policy planning problem. Now, the, the early literature in, on uh, vaccine pol vaccination policy has generally been deterministic, taking it as a problem of optimization with uh, complete information. My own interest has been in uh, studying vaccination as a problem of planning under uncertainty. So I previously uh, published uh, two papers on uh, vaccination planning under uncertainty. And uh, the first one in 2010, which was in the Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences, um, assumed that there's a, a planner with uh, lots of power. And so the planner can choose any vaccination rate uh, for the uh, population. Then the second one in 2017 is in the Journal of uh, Public Economics Theory. Uh, that says the planner has much limited, more limited um, power. It can only make a choice, a uh, binary choice. You can either mandate that everyone has to be vaccinated or you leave it as decentralized that people choose on their own whether to be uh, vaccinated. Uh, so that's the difference between those two papers. Now, the what's common in those two papers is where the uncertainty lies. It's uncertainty about the effect of vaccination on uh, disease transmission. And, and I, I, I focus on that uh, because it's, it's really a very hard problem uh, to, to try to understand how changing a vaccination rate changes disease transmission. Because of course, infection is a, a social interaction. It's a partially a biological process of people uh, you know, breathing the same air and infecting each other. But it's also uh, a, you know, a social problem of who comes into contact with who and what protection de de devices people take. Do they wear masks or this or that? And so you have epidemiological literature that goes back 100 years uh, doing epidemiological models of uh, disease transmission. Um, I, you know, about 10, 12 years ago, I spent a lot of time reading that literature. It's a literature that economists would uh, uh, find easy to follow because this is a it's it, it's 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 a bit like di dynamic stochastic general equilibrium modeling and uh, macro uh, because these are you know dynamic processes of social of interactions between people and so they have these differential equation models and they uh, you know, they set up the math and they estimate the models but I've long been critical that they don't uh, deal with the uncertainties. Uh, appropriately in the epidemiological literature. So for my own work, I wanted to uh, think about vaccination policy under uncertainty. Okay, so why did I write the new paper, uh, which I basically wrote it the last um, winter, when we were all under lockdown, uh, just before uh, we were able to get vaccinated? Um, it's because I realized, I was thinking about COVID and thinking about the uncertainties with COVID. Um, certainly, uh, disease transmission is a big uncertainty with COVID. But uh, there was also a whole set of other uncertainties regarding uh, COVID. And so I thought I needed to have a more complex uh, model to uh, deal with that. And so in, in, in addition to uncertainty about the effect of vaccination on disease transmission, there's basic data uncertainty about uh, who's susceptible. You know, how many people have actually had the disease already and how many people are still susceptible uh, to be infected. And then there's uncertainty about the effectiveness of vaccination in reducing illness and infectiousness. And I'll just you know mention now, since we've all seen you know about the vaccine trials for COVID, is they you know they were randomized trials and they may have produced a good data on how vaccination reduces the chance that the vaccinated person will become sick. But the vaccine trials that have been conducted over the past year, they they basically tell nothing about how vaccination reduces the risk of transmission because that just wasn't uh, measured at all. Um, and then there are also uncertainties about the health risks associated with vaccination. And there have been all these scares about you know, side effects of vaccination and so on. So I decided that I needed to uh, um, uh, you know, broaden out the scope of the uncertainties I wanted to deal with. Now, how do I do it? Um, I do it in this paper, in the new paper, the same way that I did it before. So for, if any of you are familiar with the earlier work that I've, any of the earlier work I've done on uh, basically on uh, social planning under ambiguity, uh, decision on you know, applications of uh, uh, decision theory under ambiguity, 
Um, instead of assuming uh, that people are, that the social planner is Bayesian and maximizes subjective expected welfare, in my work, I've tended to focus on uh, minimax criterion and particularly the minimax regret criterion. And given the uh, shortness of the seminar, there isn't going to be time to go into the math of those at all. But there's, you know, uh, the, the, you know, it's all done technically in the paper, and then there's you know plenty of other uh, papers that I've written about uh, applying uh, particularly minimax regret to social planning problems. Now, um, the difference between this paper and the earlier ones, uh, the two earlier papers I wrote, I, I I made the problem simple enough that I could get analytical solutions. So you get close form solutions for what are the uh, what's good policy from a minimax and minimax regret. Uh, perspective. In this paper, the, uh, there's more uncertainties and you can't get an analytical solution. So instead I went computationally. And what we'll get to at the very end today is uh, there's actually an app that's available online to computationally solve for uh, policies using minimax or minimax regret uh, with different uh, assumptions about the type of uncertainties there are. Okay, so that's broadly what I want to do. And now let me uh, go go through it. And as I, I know I don't have enough time to go through everything. So I'm just going to try to focus on the most important parts. Um, so I've already, uh, uh, you know, told you about this introduction. I'll mention I, I do focus on COVID, but the analysis in the paper is not specific to COVID. It could be applied to other infectious diseases. Let me uh, up front uh, make an important distinction between the way epidemiologists and economists think about this problem. In the epidemiology literature, and I think everybody knows this because we, the epidemiologists have been uh, writing and talking to the media so much about uh, COVID, is th the way they, they formulate their models, th the key thing is to suppress an epidemic. So they set up these models, these SIR models, of, uh, what they call susceptible infectious remove models. And, uh, and there are elaborations on those. And, um, and the whole point is to either prevent an epidemic before it starts or to stop an epidemic once it's uh, begun. And an epidemic is a, a dynamic concept. It's about you know, uh, in fact, increasing over time, then you say you have an epidemic. And then if the infection decreases over time, then the epidemic is stopping. And so they have this, uh, uh, parameter that I, I think people are now all familiar with, uh, uh, R0. It's, it's this, if R0 was above one, then the, you're in an epidemic phrase where this increasing infection, if R0 is below zero, this, this model, this concept is defined in terms of inside these models, then the epidemic is going to stop and, and they want to make R0 uh, below zero, uh, below one, I'm sorry. So uh, that's, that's the way they frame the problem is to uh, stop the epidemic. Um, that's okay, but th that really doesn't capture everything that uh, someone forming public policy uh, uh, should uh, uh, want to do. Uh, I have a comment here about the uh, fact that they uh, don't deal with uncertainty very well at all in these models. I won't uh, belabor that now. Maybe we can talk about it later. The uh, main thing I want to uh, focus on is that um, uh, this notion of uh, you know getting this is what, what I talked about R zero before the effective reproduction rate and to get it below one uh, that's a useful thing to do but uh, and, and then of course they say that epidemic will stop when you reach the herd immunity threshold which is also a concept defined in those uh, in those models but that's not the same as minimizing social costs okay. That, and for any economist who's going to think about vaccination policy is going to think about uh, minimizing the social cost, which is not the same as eliminating the uh, epidemic. So the economics uh, literature uh, takes that stance. Now, in terms of my own work, uh, what, I, what, what I would ideally like to do as, is to write this, is to set this up as a, as a basically a dynamic optimization problem, social welfare. A planning problem is a dynamic optimization that has the full um, uh, richness, let's say, uh, of the epidemiological models. Uh, but that's very hard to do. And so I made a decision uh, in all of the three papers I've written on this 
to formulate this as a static optimization problem rather than a dynamic optimization problem. And um, the benefit of doing that, obviously, is that it simplifies things. It's much more transparent, uh, and you can sort of see what's going on. And uh, of course, the, uh, the cost of doing that is that I may be missing things by uh, not explicitly uh, you know, trying to model uh, the dynamics. So, so what I do in all, all three of the papers is um, I abstract from the dynamics of disease transmission and study minimization of social cost of illness and vaccination as a static optimization. Uh, because it's static, I assume the vaccination occurs at a point in time rather than gradually over time. I assume that society is concerned with social cost over a specified horizon, some finite horizon, whatever you want to say, two years, five years, or whatever. And, and the other assumption I make, which is also simplifying, it's not in, innate to being static, but obviously simplifies, is I focus on the aggregate rate, vaccination rate rather than the disaggregated choice of who to vaccinate. And of course, that's important too, because it may be more important to vaccinate some parts of the population than the others. The model that I have has a concept of uh, the herd immunity threshold, and I do that in a very simple way. So there's a whole bunch of simplifying assumptions that I make quite intentionally uh, in order to get some results. But of course, uh, you know, for thinking about future research, it would be good to uh, relax all of these assumptions. Now, here's the basic problem. Which you can get, I put this in bold, uh, is, because this is the, the crux of the whole issue of vaccination, I think, is that if you uh, a higher vaccination rate is going to reduce illness, but it's going to raise the social cost of, of vaccination. Okay, uh, what's in the social cost of vaccination? Well, it's obviously the cost of uh, producing the vaccines, administering the vaccines. There may also be other things. This all before we uh, when I was, uh, talking with Giovanni and Lucio before we were talking about the anti-vax movement and all the people who really resist. Uh, being vaccinated. So you could think of that as a, a social cost of a higher vaccination rate as well and put that in the model if you want. Um, but, but that's the basic tension is, is that a higher vaccination rate has a benefit in terms of reducing illness, but it has a cost in, uh, in various respects. Um, okay. So then I start setting out the model. Okay, I'm going to take some time watching the clock here because I know that short talk. So I'm going to set out some basic notation and uh, get to the social cost function. And then I'm going to skip ahead because uh, I want to talk about the uncertainties. So I take this SIR perspective. So we'll let S, which is positive, is the fraction of the population who is susceptible to illness at a particular date. We're, we're talking about making this vaccine uh, policy decision at a particular date and time. I is the fraction who are currently infected. So that's positive too. Later on, I said I as an approximation equal to zero, that the fraction of people, if you take COVID, people are only infected for a couple, two or three weeks. So the fraction who are currently infected is actually a fairly uh, small fraction of the population. So as approximation, I, I later uh, set that equal to zero. And uh, so, but S is the people who have not been infected yet, that's here. And then R are the people who have recovered from infection. And uh, so again, with COVID, of course, there's been a death rate, which is non-trivial, of course, but uh, I will basically assume, you know, as a fraction of the whole population, the death rate is still fortunately pretty small. So uh, we're gonna talk about people recovering rather than dying, because I didn't wanna get into the dynamics of population where uh, population changes over time due to death. That, that will complicate things quite a bit. Uh, and then I assume that when someone recovers, they have permanent uh, what's called sterilizing immunity. Uh, that means that once you've recovered, you cannot get sick again. Now, when I was writing the paper back last uh, winter, um, that seemed like a very good assumption for COVID. It, at the time, it was thought that when people, uh, once they had COVID and they recovered, that you could not get it again. Uh, by now we know that's not true, that people can be reinfected. So um, one would have to relax that assumption today, but that is an assumption I made uh, to simplify things in the paper, given the knowledge I had at the time. Now, how, what does vaccination do? It, it has two effects. There's a, a direct preventive effect on the person vaccinated, that if I vaccinate a person, that lessens the chance that that person will get sick themselves. And then it has an indirect preventive effect on other persons, that's the uh, transmission effect. 
And we need to separate those two uh, because they're both very important. So to formalize the direct effect, I say there's some probability that the, uh, a vac that the vaccine works on a person and there's some probability that it doesn't to make it very simple. So if you get vaccinated, then there's some probability lambda uh, that you will not get sick. And uh, then there's some probability one minus lambda that you will get sick. Okay, and then let's let V denote the rate of vaccination in susceptible persons. Then I define what I call the effective vaccination rate is just lambda times V. So if I vaccinate 60% uh, of the people and the vaccine is effective 80% of the time, then the effective vaccination rate is, is 0.6 times 0.8 or 0.48. So then what fraction of the people are susceptible well, if you take the total fraction who are susceptible and subtract off lambda V, because these are the people who are for whom the vaccine works. So the total fraction of the people who are susceptible is one minus lambda V uh, times uh, S, okay? So that's kind of basic notation there. Now, um, but that's not enough because that's only the direct effect of vaccination. We also have to uh, worry about the uh, the effect of vaccination on preventing transmission of disease. That's the indirect effects. So then we need another parameter mu. So mu is the probability that if a person's vaccinated, mu is the uh, chance that the vaccination prevents that person from transmitting the disease to someone else. And we know that that's harder. I mean, if we, I mean, even as a, you know, even I'm, obviously I'm not an immunologist, but uh, I think all of us have learned uh, that it's uh, it's easier to prevent a person from getting sick than to prevent that person from transmitting it, because uh, to get you could still have the virus on the your own body, and you, but but at a low level and not get sick, but just by breathing you may still transmit the uh, virus uh, to other people. So in the paper I make the assumption that mu is less than uh, a lambda. So so they're all vaccines are less effective in preventing transmission than they are in uh, direct uh, prevention of disease. So if you look at, well, what's the fraction of people who cannot transmit uh, disease, it's two components, uh, are the people who've already had COVID, uh, in my model, they cannot transmit because they, they get what's called sterilizing immunity and, they, and, and uh, they're, they're like totally uh, free of the vaccine, although that may not be realistic. And then, uh, and then, and then the uh, people who were susceptible, then the effective rate of, of preventing transmission is mu v. So the total fraction of the people who cannot transmit is mu v times s plus r. So these are basic uh, pieces of the notation. Um, and then the final piece of notation is an infection rate, which I write as p of theta. Theta is a vector of parameters. Theta is all the things uh, is the is the fraction of susceptible people who will become infected. And that fraction who will become infected depends on the values of S, R, lambda, mu, and V. Those are all, these are all parameters in the model, uh, S, R, L, mu, and V. And, uh, and then the fract, and then theta is just that vector. And then P of theta is the fraction who will get infected. So total prevalence, the total fraction of the population who get infected is this. Okay, so one minus lambda V times S is the fraction of people who could get infected. And then all the people who could get infected, you multiply that times the probability of getting infected, uh, which is P of theta. And so this is the total infection rate, okay? And then in this model, the right here is increasing the vaccination rate. This, you know, this is basically how many people are gonna get sick. Uh, as of the date that we're talking about. And the, increasing the vaccination rate Ill, reduces illness prevalence in two ways. First, it reduces the fraction of people who are susceptible, one minus lambda V times S. But then second, it reduces the infection rate among those who are susceptible. And that's because the infection rate depends on mu here and all these other things. So even if you're susceptible, if other people have had a, you know, the vaccination rate is higher, then there's fewer people to transmit the disease to you. So, so there's actually um, the V, the V shows up explicitly in here. And you can see that that's the direct rate uh, effect of vaccination that lowers the illness profession. But the V is also inside the theta here. And that's also a, a negative effect. 
So the two uh, um, interacting uh, negative forces, so that as V increases, the uh, prevalence goes down, okay? Um, then a final uh, assumption I make to simplify is that there is a what I call a sharp herd immunity threshold. Uh, you, you know, in, in the uh, some of the epidemiological models are just like this. They 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 assume that you reach some uh, rate, uh, which I call H star, is the herd immunity threshold. And once you reach that threshold, then no one ever gets infected after that. Now, sophisticated epidemiological models don't do that. They realize that. What's going to happen is that they say the Herman immunity threshold is where the effective reproduction rate, the R zero, goes below one. But then there's still going to be a lag because some people are still going to get infected even after you reach that rate. Uh, but again, to simplify things, because I don't have a dynamic model with static, I say once you hit H star, you know, we for COVID, people used to think it was 70% of the population. If you go back a year ago, everyone was saying if you got 70% of people uh, who were either vaccinated or had COVID, then it would stop. And then they said, no, nah, it's not 70%, it's 80%. Uh, so they weren't sure on what that number would be. But let's just assume there is some fraction HDR. Okay. Okay. So here I make the assumption that the fraction who are currently infected is zero. You get some simplifications here because now it's just that S plus R is equal to one because you don't have to worry about the I's. And then the fraction of non-transmitters have to take the simpler functional form. And I don't, uh, I don't want to you know, dwell too much on the uh, specifics of this. this is, it's pretty easy, but I, I know it's, uh, you know. So this I'm not going to go through at all. And just to tell you, I don't want to go through line by line. It's just to say that uh, when you think about how the infection rate, how the infection rate uh, varies with uh, all these things, there are three possible regimes. In, in, uh, depending on the parameters here, if, uh, if, if this inequality holds, then the infection rate is going to be zero. And uh, if, that, if the opposite of that inequality holds, then there are two possibilities. Either the infection rate is, uh, well, the infection rate um, is uh, the P of theta here is, is going to be some positive value that brings total infection uh, up to the herd immunity threshold uh, so that this thing actually becomes an equality and then P of theta solves that equality. Or for other parameter values, the uh, everybody's uh, this is going to be a strict inequality and uh, everyone's going to be infected. So, so it turns out this is important in the math of the solving the, the model that there are three, three possible regimes uh, depending on what these uh, parameters are. So, so there are some, I said this, uh, you know, I've uh, sort of apologized for this being a simple static model, but there's a fair number of subtleties even in the static model that you can have these uh, three regimes. And I, of course I have to go through and solve the model under in each of these cases. Uh, so what you get is, and this is what I was just saying for the effect of for the infection rate for P theta, uh, it could either be zero if this inequality holds, it could be one if these inequalities hold, or it can be uh, strictly between zero and one if uh, these inequalities uh, over here hold, okay? So let's not worry about the exact algebra. It's just that there are those three regimes. Here is what I wanna focus on. This is the basic equation of the social cost of illness and vaccination. So there's gonna be a parameter B, which is the, social cost per case of illness or mean social cost, because there may be, of course, heterogeneity that some illnesses are mild and some illnesses are severe. So this would be the average social cost per uh, case of illness. And uh, K is the mean social cost per vaccination. And we have to measure them in uh, the same units, of course. Uh, so you can, you know, you just have to get the scaling right, measure everything in terms of uh, illness units or cost, what, whatever. I mean, just we're doing cost benefit analysis, so of course we have to uh, normalize the uh, units. So here is the basic, uh, is the social cost function. So this is the social cost of uh, vaccination rate V. The cost, and I, I just assume that the cost for that is constant the marginal cost per uh, vaccination. Um, you know, of course, that may not be true as well. Uh, it, part of the, the nice thing about, if you think about uh, all the public discussion 
about vaccination policy. It's all verbal. And so people, I could talk about this in words, but that doesn't tell you, uh, you know, uh, algebraically what it is. Of course, when you write this down as we, we economists, you know, uh, uh, do it may, it may have, you have to be rigorous and say, what is the cost function? So this is a very simple cost function that says it's a uh, constant marginal cost of vaccination. That may not be true in the real world. There may be a fixed cost of vaccination for setting up uh, production facilities and, uh, you know, places to vaccinate people. There may be increasing uh, cost of vaccination if you have these anti-vaxxers. So, you know, some people want to get vaccinated, but then later on, it gets harder and harder to vaccinate. You know, people more and more refuse. So this could be increasing cost. Uh, I just assume, for simplicity, uh, constant marginal cost of uh, vaccination. And similarly, I assume constant marginal cost of illness, which is B. So uh, this thing over here is the fraction of the people who get sick. And then you multiply that times B, which is the cost and marginal cost of illness. That, that may not be linear either. If you think about a, you know, a society, um, maybe if, if the illness rate is small, you deal with things fine. It's just cost and marginal cost. But as we all know, with the hospitals getting overloaded and uh, supply chains break down, you know, so that the, co the cost per illness could actually be quite increasing. Um, so, so there's actually could be lots of subtleties on this social cost function. But uh, even with this linear form, it suffices to make the basic point that um, you have this tension between cost and benefits. From the, if I increase the vaccination rate, because K is positive, the cost of vaccine, marginal cost of vaccination is positive, increasing the vaccination rate increases the social cost. But on the other hand, as I increase the vaccination rate, um, then uh, the, the fraction of people who get sick decreases. That's partially through here because that's negative uh, effect. And partially it's inside here with the P theta that that's also a negative effect. And uh, this can be a fairly complex tension. What the social planner wants to do, if the social planner has full power and it's all deterministic, if there's no uncertainties, uh, social planner wants to minimize this function. And because uh, this part is uh, decreasing in V uh, non-linearly, quite non-linearly, and this part is increasing in V, uh, that can be a, a fairly uh, subtle problem. So that's the kind of problem we want to look at. And uh, it simplifies a bit the social, uh, again, I don't want to go through the details, with this um, uh, notion of a sharp herd immunity threshold, then the social uh, cost function uh, becomes simpler. And uh, then I even go through the uh, uh, two cases, optimal unconstrained choice of vaccination rate. So if the social planner can choose what fraction of people to vaccinate and assume that they do that randomly, they just choose you know 80% of the population randomly and they vaccinate them, uh, then you can solve for the uh, uh, optimal social, optimal vaccination policy. And so that's right here. Again, don't want to go through the details. This is just the solution for the optimal vaccination policy. Um, if it's uh, a choice of a mandate versus decentralization, then you can't just choose any uh, vaccination rate you want. You only have two choices. One is V equals one means a mandate. You just say everyone's going to get vaccinated. So that's one possibility. In decentralization, you have VD. Uh, v sub D is what the vaccination rate will be if people make their own choices. And then you just have to compare those two rates. Uh, mandating, uh, so if mandating yields lower social cost than decentralization, you mandate and otherwise you uh, allow decentralization. And so you can solve for that. Okay, so that's a deterministic problem. Now I go through in the paper, uh, some exercises with illustrative parameter values. I'm not gonna take the time to do that. Uh, just there's a figure in the paper that shows where the minimum social cost is um, under the, uh, in that illustration. The red line here is the social cost function. It reaches a minimum here. This is where there's a regime change. So the, this is piecewise linear that comes out of the algebra of the model. And then this is what the happens with the illness rate because you reach the herd immunity th threshold here and then it's, uh, constant at zero uh, at that point on. Okay, so that's the deterministic problem. Now, the rest of the time, I want to talk about the uncertainties, okay, because uh, that's really uh, what I really care about is doing this with uncertainty. And I'm not going to take the time to go through the math of a minimax regret policy solution or anything. I think it's more important to understand conceptually what the uh, uncertainties are. 
Um, so we have all these parameters. To solve the deterministic problem, you would have to know all these things. But if you look at them, a lot of them are just unknown. So H star is the human immunity threshold. And I've already said that uh, these epidemiological models have a, you know, they have embedded in the model some herd immunity threshold, but they don't agree on what it is because that depends on the particular model and depends on what assumptions are in the model about transmission rates and so on. Uh, so, so there is uncertainty about what the herd immunity threshold actually is. Then we have a case of uh, S which is very, uh, it was just how, how many people are susceptible. So um, this, this, you know, this is a big deal with COVID. It's been very hard to actually estimate what the infection rate has been uh, for two reasons. It's because we have selective testing, particularly early on in the uh, pandemic, but it's also true the selective testing today is, is that we don't know who has COVID or not. You only learn if someone has been infected if you do a test. And the confirmed cases are measured by rates of positive results among people who have been tested. And we don't have data for people who have not been tested and the testing is very selective. So this is not random testing that's been done, it's been selective testing. Second problem that's received less attention is that the, 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 the test for COVID, particularly this enable swab test, they're not fully accurate. And in fact, they're not fully accurate in a very asymmetric uh, way that um, if you test positive, then it's pretty clear you did have the disease. But if you test negative, uh, you may still have had the disease and the test may have missed it. So I reference here, so back, uh, uh, it's almost a year and a half, back in March, 2020, uh, Francesco Molinari and I, uh, we decided to analyze this problem of limited knowledge of S as a identification problem, problem missing data. So we very quickly uh, wrote a paper on that, got published in the Journal of Econometrics uh, right there. Um, you can read that if you want, but you also have an expert uh, right on uh, among you in Rome right now is that I know Franco Paraki uh, began working on uh, this problem as well. And a variety of others of our other econometricians have worked on this. So besides Francesca and me and uh, Franco and uh, there have been a whole set of uh, papers written by econometricians about the, basically the problem of uh, inferring the uh, uh, infection rate, um, which is one minus the susceptibility rate, basically, um, uh, given the limited information that's available. So, for, so there's limited information about S. That's that's where we, and uncertainty about S. Okay. Now we have lambda and mu. Lambda has been pretty well known. It's been because you have the vaccine trials. That's the direct effect. Well, I would have said that. I shouldn't change that. Back when the vaccine trials came out, you think about the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine and uh, AstraZeneca, there was a, there was a reported uh, effectiveness rate, like 95% or 90% or 80%. And uh, it was thought that that was very well known. So when I was writing this paper, I said, well, Lambda is pretty well known. What had not been realized, and I'm thinking about this now in October, relative to what I wrote back uh, last January or February, is we thought that once you were vaccinated, that was it. W what was not realized back then is that the uh, immunity might uh, lessen over time, e either because it just wears off or because there'd be a new variant of the disease like the Delta variant. And so now we've realized there's been uncertainty about Lambda. And we, you know, and I, I just, my wife and I just received booster shots a few weeks ago because uh, we have the Pfizer vaccine, because uh, you know there was evidence that after six months or so that the lambda had decreased for the Pfizer vaccine, and I think that's true for all of them. So um, you know, so in my model, I allow for uh, for uncertainty about lambda. I honestly wasn't worried about that too much when I wrote the paper. You worry about it more now. Mu, there's clearly lots of uncertainty. Is what the effectiveness of vaccination is on reducing transmission. We really know very little about that because the vaccine trials just didn't measure it. There was, it's very hard in any randomized trial to try to, uh, when you think about analyzing treatment effects in a randomized trial, you measure the effect of treatment on the person who's treated. To uh, try to study social interactions where you know that vaccinating one person may lower the risk that that person will transmit the disease to someone else. That's harder. It can be done. There are ways biologically to, to at least get some information on it, uh, but that the data basically wasn't collected in the vaccine trials. So there's a lot of uncertainty about mu. 
and B of K, these are these are parameters on the social cost function. And each one of those, you know, would be subject to uncertainty is, uh, you know, what do we mean by the social cost of an additional illness? What do we mean by the social cost of an additional vaccination? So you got all these uh, uncertainties put together. And uh, I go through here just the uh, discussion of this. And now, given the, I know we only have a few more minutes, I, I knew when I got get here that I wouldn't have the time to go through this, what, but I'm just going to just talk it through, is I start applying the basic decision theory. I'm just going to scroll through here uh, just to get to the end and uh, write down uh, under uncertainty what the uh, constrained, uh, which is just ma mandate versus non-mandate versus unconstrained optimization problems uh, would be. And uh, you can't optimize, but you can solve them in different ways. You could be either Bayesian or you could use minimax or minimax regret. So uh, I looked at all of them. I do not have analytical solutions in this paper, okay? But you can solve all of these things computationally. Let me just go straight through this to the very last slide, which is this. This is the very last slide. And this is a screenshot from an app uh, that uh, is now available uh, online. The uh, thing here, it says Valentin Litvin, that's my uh, uh, research assistant. Uh, this is now available online from the Institute for Policy research here at um, Northwestern. When I made, when I took the screenshot, I was doing it off of the uh, a beta version rather than before we put it up. But you can uh, see what we do here, and I'm going to end with the slide. Is that you can uh, put in? It's going to solve for minimax regret and uh, minimax solutions by uh, doing a numerical uh, minimization, maximization uh, with grids you know, finite grids on this of state space and, and so on. Um, and so these first parameters here are the grid sizes and so on. But then the substantive parameters are all the different uncertainties. So first is H star, uh, which is the herd immunity rate. So in this particular illustration, you say, well, I think the herd immunity rate is between uh, 0.6 and 0.8. And then ask about the fraction who's susceptible. I say, well, let's imagine it's between 0.5 and 0.8, that that's the information I have available. You can put in any values of the parameters that you want. And uh, then we have the lambda, that's the, uh, uh, you know, the effectiveness, the direct effectiveness of the vaccine. How do I say here? Because at the time I thought we knew that uh, Pfizer and Moderna were 95% effective. So I, I had no uncertainty, I just said 0 0.95, 0 0.95. For uh, Lambda, for Mu, I'm sorry, uh, where is the, oh, I changed the, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, there's a notational change at some point here. And uh, where is the, uh, yeah, to this V, okay, I wanna go through that. I, tra I translate the Mu parameter into this new parameter here. I thought it was a V at first, but that's a Greek new. And so this is your bound on the uh, probability of uh, preventing transmission. And uh, then we have one on the social cost of vaccination K. You can normalize the B parameter to be equal to one. That's just the normalization. So you put in values for these parameters and uh, then it does the uh, calculation. And here's what you get as for, uh, this would be the minimax regret solution. It would be right over here. And, uh, what, and then there's further information about these regimes that I talked about. Uh, before and uh, what the illness rate would be at that point. And then there's a bunch of other statistics that get. So, so this is available. Uh, uh, you can go to the uh, website at Institute for Policy Research and uh, in some sub page there, you can find this uh, app to uh, do that. Okay, I wanna keep on time and leave time for some discussion. So I'm gonna stop uh, sharing at this point. I hope that I, uh, uh, you know, sorry, I couldn't go through all the algebra line by line, but that makes things easier for you. So, uh, so I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. If there are any questions from the audience, uh, you can uh, use the uh, reaction function of raise the hand. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, yes, Franco, please. Yeah, um, Chuck, can you say something about how different the solutions are under uh, the three cases, Bayesian, uh, Minimax, and Minimax Regret, and what extra information requirements uh, you need? Uh, 
for example, the patient will require priors, what kind of priors, et cetera? Well, okay. So, uh, you know, uh, for, for Minimax Regret, this is a unique solution, and for Minimax is a unique solution, um, and they generally differ. Uh, some uh, people, uh, uh, you know, there's sometimes confusion that Minimax Regret and Minimax are the same thing, but they're, they're not at all. Mathematically, they're quite different. The easiest way to see that is to actually uh, look at the criterion function. Um, there's very special cases algebraically where they give the same solution, but generically they're different. How different they are uh, depends on the particular application. And, you know, in this case, I, I mean, it's not that I've done it exhaustively, but it, it could be, you know, it could be 10, 20% different. You might say that Minimax regret, maybe you want to vaccinate 70% of people, but um, for Minimax, you might want to vaccinate 90%. So it could be meaningful. In, in other, I've done many applications doing it both ways. Sometimes they give extremely different solutions because Minimax is very, is really is ultra conservative doing the worst case analysis in absolute terms. Minimax regret, it has that term Minimax in it, but it's it's really means near, what Minimax regret really means is uniformly near optimal. And so it, Minimax regret is not conservative in the sense that Minimax is, it's, it's you wanna minimize the distance from optimality and it makes very different trade-offs between costs and benefits. So, um, uh, so they really are, uh, they reflect different social preferences. It's the same thing if you're doing expected welfare maximization in the traditional sense that you think about is a person risk neutral or the social plan or risk neutral or risk averse. I don't mean it's the same mathematically, but conceptually that obviously you get different solutions to a social planning problem if, if someone's risk neutral versus risk averse. And it would depend on how risk averse they might be and on and on then, uh, you know, so you want to do things, uh, they, they really are different. Now for Bayesian, of course, there's no unique answer because for Bayesian, everything depends on the prior. So you, you can get anything out with being Bayesian depending on what your prior is. So for the app that's available online, um, you have to insert a, uh, uh, we allow, you can insert a, uh, uh, the screenshot I had may not have been done before we had the Bayesian thing programmed but we later programmed the Bayesian. Um, you basically, you have a bunch of parameters and you put beta distributions on them just to make it simple. And, uh, and then the results that come out will depend critically on uh, the priors. You, you know, econometricians sometimes say, uh, or Bayesian statisticians, the priors don't matter asymptotically. You know, sample size goes up, the priors don't matter. That's nonsense here. These are all partial identification problems. The priors matter. And uh, it's it's you can't appeal to any asymptotics to say that uh, priors don't matter. So so you do get uh, very you know possibly quite different solutions for all of these different criteria. Okay, please, Robert. Uh, Robert Grant. Uh, hi. Um, thank you very much, Professor Manske. I enjoyed your talk very much. I'm a, a medical statistician by background, so it's, in, so it's interesting to me, and I'm a Bayesian. And um, I wanted to ask you about the, the central problem, which is the, the paucity of detailed, nuanced data that we can use to build nuanced and detailed models, and maybe even to beat the partial identification problem. And I know that <clears throat> you've been critical of meta-analysis, and quite rightly, uh -huh. that um, very often it's done in a very uh, ritualized way, a mechanistic way without a thought to, to expanding the scope for what can be uh, synthesized. And I, I would really just like to ask your view on what the most important thing is you think that methodologists could do to try and get researchers producing better, more nuanced data? Um, uh, what Robert's referring to on meta-analysis is, uh, I can see with your background in uh, medical stuff, I published a paper in the epidemiology journal a year ago, which is uh, quite critical of uh, the conventional performance of meta-analysis, uh, particularly using random effects models. And, um, uh, wrote instead that this should be uh, viewed, I, I called it patient-centered meta-analysis 
and taking a partial uh, identification perspective. For, for those of you who know about partial identification, uh, it comes out as intersection bounds is what you should do. Now there are two aspects. Um, I, I think I think Robert asked you asked about in terms of getting better data. Um, getting better data better data takes time uh, to do that. Um, my own uh, concern over the shorter run is to uh, if if we have the data that we have, is to uh, analyze the data with uh, more credible assumptions, weaker assumptions. So which would uh, then acknowledge the uncertainty uh, as we do formally in partial identification analysis. So uh, what actually uh, uh, I'm very critical of, and it, I, I mean, in, uh, my views about epidemiological modeling, uh, this is like cost and benefits. I, I, I really much admire the mathematics. It's over a hundred years of developing more and more subtle epidemiological models. But at the same time, I find it very frustrating that the calibration of those models, you know, the understanding of uh, whether the uh, modeling assumptions are correct, the parameter estimation and so on. I just, I, you know, where does that come from? So I, I tend to view them and I see his, his hand is going, his fingers going. Uh, I, I view them more as computational exercises rather than take them seriously. Um, I, I'm, if most of the people on here are economists, uh, I will say it's not just a problem in epidemiology. There's similar problems with dynamic macroeconomic analysis. Which is you know very the same. Now I don't know, Robert. Are you in the UK or in Italy or where? Uh, yeah, I'm in the UK. Yes. Yeah. So in the UK, of course, and I was actually. Uh, it's a kind of a nightmare. My wife and I survived it. We were in London and Glasgow left in March 2020 when everything went boom. We had no idea what we were getting into. We we made it back home, and then we both got COVID. We think. But anyway, we survived. Um, so I, I was there when the Imperial College team, you know, Neil Ferguson and so on, you must know this better than me, when they came out with their uh, study and they came out with point, you know, they had taken this model for a flu pandemic. Of course, they had no data, no models for COVID. And yet somehow within a few weeks, they were doing point forecast of the trajectory of uh, COVID. And they were telling the British government to go for suppression versus mitigation. And I said, how in the world can you, can you do that, uh, right? And but they did, and then the Amer and they were influential in the United States as well. And then there's the group at the University of Washington, the IHME group, that was doing the same thing. And I, I find that actually quite problematic. To uh, there's a term I use uh, uh, in many I call incredible certitude, is when people act as if they know things for sure, but there's no real basis. So the very even before getting better data, um, I think the immediate thing you can do is to be more honest about what you can learn with existing data. And that would be to then produce bounds and confidence sets and all of those measures of uncertainty rather than making these point forecasts. Now, over the longer run, of course, um, one would like to get uh, better data and do a better job of modeling. That's, uh, and uh, I, I, it'd be hard for me to say what's the one type of data that we should need to get because I. With all the different uncertainties that I mentioned, I think we need to make progress on all of them. Uh, but I, I, I see a huge um, sort of long-term agenda in moving pandemic planning towards uh, uh, transparent recognition of uncertainty and collecting better data uh, to do a better job. So we'll be in uh, you know, better shape the next time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Robert. Uh, I think there is another question by Giovanni. Giovanni Chirulli, please, Giovanni. Thank you, Chuck, for your presentation. It was uh, really clear. I I read the paper a couple of times, to be honest, <laughs> because the first time was a bit uh, just for understanding, and then I I went into a, a bit uh, the more technical details. Um, uh, I was wondering uh, why you uh, jumped the part in which you finally, uh, the, the last part basically, in which you were comparing, um, I think it was quite interesting for this reason, uh, when you uh, found the, the threshold of the uh, decentralized vaccination rate that uh, make uh, decentralized uh, more convenient than uh, preferable than uh, decentralized one. But anyway, it was a uh, uh, probably because you didn't want to provide the directly um, 
um, a final word about it because I imagine that it depends on the parameters and uh, that's, that's of course a really, really uh, compelling. My, my question is another one. This is just a, a first, um, a first um, uh, point. My, my question is another one. Um, I, I appreciate a lot the, the model of Kurtz, uh, although I'm not an expert about this, but uh, my, my point is that when comparing the rate of uh, vaccination in the, in the centralized setting against a uh, centralized setting, my point is, uh, are the, maybe the two populations similar? I mean, no. Uh, I mean, what, what I want to say is that suppose that we are considering uh, the centralized situation, it's very likely that more educated people are going to uh, get vaccinated than in our mandate situation. And uh, so the two subpopulations may be different by inducing different costs in the, in the, in the, in the society. I mean, uh, I mean that basically the two um, uh, scenarios um, are not easy to compare uh, if we do not take into account this selection process operated by, because that is, is a decision process in, in one case uh, from, from, from different individuals and is a planning the, is, is as when it's centralized is decided from the, the top to the bottom. So oh. the, com the comparison is not easy. And my very last second point is, in your opinion, uh, we could, this is a more general point, we could, uh, uh, in your opinion, it's possible to apply empirical welfare maximization based on past uh, vaccination experiences and uh, maybe other experiences in terms of pandemic to identify, for example, the optimal level of uh, vaccination rate. That's my point is a very, the last one is very, you know, just um, just a thought. <laughs> okay, okay they, the, the two points are very different. So let me uh, separate them. Um, uh, you know, I said at the beginning that the model in this paper was gonna have some very simplifying assumptions and so it does not have a kind of heterogeneity so that you'd have selective uh, uh, voluntary uh, vaccination. Uh, and I, I'm, of course, I mean, every economist is gonna understand if you decentralize, then and it's a heterogeneous population, then the, there's gonna be selection into vaccination and the people who choose to vaccinate may be different than the ones uh, who don't. So I, I left that out of this model uh, paper because I wanted to uh, focus on other things. But I did not leave that out of the 2017 paper. So I don't know if you, you said you read this paper, but the published paper in 2017, which really focuses on mandate versus decentralization. That goes through two uh, sections. The first part is very uh, simple with a representative agent model. So this issue of heterogeneity doesn't arise with the representative agent model. But then the second analysis in the paper has a uh, heterogeneous agent model. Uh, which is much more, that's what I feel much more comfortable with. I'm a microeconomist, not a macroeconomist. So I prefer to have heterogeneous agents. And then there would be selection uh, into who vaccinates with the decentralization. So, um, so if you're interested in that aspect, um, um, I think you should go back, go take a look at the 2017 paper, uh, because that's, because that particularly, I think it's section four, the, the section with the heterogeneous agent model. Um, that, uh, that that's what the fo focus is there. So obviously I agree with you substantively. And in fact, some of my earlier work uh, deals with that. Now, the second point that Giovanni made was about empirical welfare maximization. I'm not sure how many of you, this is, uh, I, I do lots of work on statistical decision theory. And so that's with finite sample data and uh, using the Wald framework and uh, empirical welfare maximization is a, uh, a development out of that uh, associated with uh, uh, Toro Kitagawa and uh, Alex Tetanoff. And for, you're all in Italy, so many, some of you may know Alex because his first job was uh, Collegio uh, Calo Alberto in uh, Torino. So some of you may know Alex. So they published an econometrica a few years ago on, but that's not really relevant to this paper because all of that stuff about statistical decision theory and uh, EWF, um, AEWM falls within that. That's about analysis with finite sample data. 
And um, my, my papers on vaccination are not about using finite sample data at all. You can, I mean, that'd be another direct, total you know, direction for extension is to think about planning where you have random sample data and you need to uh, use that. But that, that will go off in a whole different direction. You know, when I talk about decision making under ambiguity, it's with the, with bounds on these parameters, and there's nothing in any of the papers I've written on vaccination that involves analysis of finite sample data. So that's uh, that would go off in a different direction. Uh, I'm be a good thing to do, but I have nothing to uh, you know say about it at the moment. Okay, thank you. We have another question by Luigi. I think you're muted. Yeah, I think you have to uh, switch on the, the microphone. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, thank you from me too. It was splendid, your conference uh, and uh, very rigorous. That is very important for me. Uh, I am a chemist. So, as chemists, I'm influenced by what we call the, the, the quality of the measurements. So, my question is, is it possible to quote which is the percentage uncertainness level of this uh, approach? I mean, uh, propagations of errors from one value to the others. How much does it influence the results so that we can say that the, the conclusion can be considered at, uh, at the accuracy about 10%, 15% or how much? Um, okay. Um, there is no simple way to decompose the uncertainty and say it's 10% this, 20%, 30% this, because the model structure is highly nonlinear. And uh, it doesn't just add up that you get, uh, that you can do a decomposition. It, it depends, uh, mathematically, it's going to depend on the interaction of all of these things. Now, um, you can still look at it holistically, and say um, uh, and ask with the particular configuration of let's say bounds on all the parameters, then uh, um, how much does that affect things overall? And then the uh, the way from a decision making perspective, um, the way I would measure that would be by the value of maximum regret. So here you have to start getting into the the math. Is see if there's no uncertainty, but let me try to explain it in words. Because if you're a chemist, you should be able to go back and read the math to uh, understand rigorously what I mean. Um, if, if there's an optimization problem, uh, if, I, if, if I know everything perfectly, I can solve an optimization problem and I'll get the exact optimum. And so that's great. That's the ideal circumstance. But uh, when there are all these uncertainties, then I can't solve the optimization problem. And I can, what I can't compute is this maximum regret, which is um, the... Uh, mathematics, it's the unit, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's the distance from optimality, uniform distance from optimality. So it's a map, and you can say how, how far from optimal are you? And so the effect, the overall effect of uncertainty is that it, it reduces, it means that you can't do the optimal thing, but to say how far are you away from being able to do the optimal thing? And so I would measure uncertainty, the effect of uncertainty on decision making by um, how much it reduces the possibility of uh, uh, getting an optimal solution. And, and that can be done in a formal mathematical way. But the, the point is that I would do it starting from the decision problem and, and uh, so how much worse is your decision making as a result of the uh, uncertainty? It's, it's hard to say more about this without actually starting to write down uh, equations, but that's the way, uh, the way I would do it, uh, to be totally coherent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, any other question? 
Okay, I think that we can uh, we can uh, stop here the seminar. Uh, I want just to thank again uh, Professor Monsky. Uh, I want to thank all the audience for the participation and for the question. And I hope that you uh, that we we will have the possibility to invite Professor Monsky in my person here in Rome in future. You know. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I hope yeah. as soon as possible. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the participation uh, of all the audience. And uh, I invite you to uh, follow our uh, web page to for the next seminars. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye -bye. Happy to Bye -bye. Thanks Bye. to Jack, Bye -bye. thanks to the organizers, and Bye. thanks to everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.